Alright guys, Hatch Crown back again today. Hope you're doing well and enjoying your day so far. And after all the Nadejot versus Crim6 drama of the last couple of days, Skump has actually responded to Nadejot's frustrations with the way Skump reacted to Crim6's initial comments. Crim made the comments that apparently were entirely fabricated. Skump did not defend Nadejot on that one. Nade's not happy about it. Skump says, what do you want me to do? Lots of drama to dive into here. Very much enjoy to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. This is the side station for the Black Ops 2 throwback tournament starting tomorrow. And, um, and I don't know if Hitch is going to have an alternate banner here because, you know, of course, Nadejot no longer attending as we saw earlier today. Before we get into the whole Skump versus Nadejot stuff briefly, I do want to mention quickly on Rostermania because there's potentially a lot happening soon, especially because of this tweet from the Carolina Royal Ravens. Rostermania has been a bit quiet, hasn't it? Now, we don't have, at least as a recording, any rumours as to what the Royal Ravens might want to do, but the question is, which team is going to move first? Out of Vegas Legion, out of the Royal Ravens, Carolina now, out of Los Angeles Grillers, which team is going to move first? Because the team that moves first is probably the team that has a chance of actually, well, making champs. I don't think that any of these teams are going to be winning events or anything. But of the players that are remaining, if you move quick and you get, you know, Clay, Attach, Standy, Nero, whatever, those are just four names that have come to mind because they're some of the best and they could potentially form a coherent unit of four. But whoever moves first and signs those caliber players, and obviously Temp is out there as an option as well, plenty of others also... And I think Beans is also like, in terms of Lion Man rating cards, he's up there, but he's got a buyout from Boston, I think. So yeah, Beans is probably not in a great position to go to another team, unfortunately. He's probably going to be stuck on the bench because none of these teams are going to want to pay a buyout when there's players that they can get for free. So whichever of these remaining teams decides to actually take the plunge and sign some players probably puts themselves in a better position. So maybe Ravens are going to be the first to move. Who does that involve? I guess that remains to be seen. Now, this Dynasty podcast had a lot to say. There was also a bit of drama on the sound equalization. Crim6 was talking about it during the Cold War days. What happened there? And even Asti has commented on this as well and said that even in the current day, that sound EQ has kind of ruined Black Ops Cold War because, um, you know, and even Prolute responds and says sound EQ players are terrible and, you know, people are calling Prolute like EQ loot or whatever because apparently in the off-season tournaments that they were playing a few weeks ago, Prolute was, you know, definitely cranking that head to all the way to the top, shall we say. But, um, you know, that was happening as well. But the main talking point, of course, was Nadejot's opinion on the way he felt that he was getting treated by his former team. I think there's an argument that maybe Optic should have thought a little bit more about how they prepare that section of the podcast, because the dynasty, as I've said is not just Krim, Formal, Scump, and Karma. Nadechart was a big part of it when they first formed. And to be honest, Nadechart, in the same way that for the Complexity Dynasty, you've got to consider the Clayster period and the Karma period. You've got to consider the same for Nadechart, because if you look at the Dynasty's accomplishments, and yet you leave out the like three events they won with Nadecharts, that doesn't make much sense. So you've got to consider Nadejot in that period and the fact that he wasn't there. It's not like they had to invite him or anything and he had to sit there and just, you know, for the few minutes because he wasn't part of the entire period. But I feel like they could have better prepared the segment where they had to discuss the Nadejot change for Karma. And, um, you know, in doing so... Nadejot was felt frustrated by the things that were said. Not just the Crimsic stuff, although that will have been a big part of it. I actually think the main part that might have got to Nadejot, or the part that, you know, I think would have got to me if I was in Nadejot's position, was when the team was discussing... Krim basically wanted to have his name cleared that he wasn't just the man that got Krim dropped he, or that got Nadejot dropped. He was saying, look guys, did you guys also not want Nade dropped as well? And Formal said, yep. And Scum said, yeah, basically we wanted him gone. And, you know, I think that if I was Nadejot hearing this, I would have thought, even though it might be the complete truth of the matter... I might not have been so happy hearing this. So I think that maybe he heard this from Scum, but he was thinking, damn, can, you know, come on, son. Can you not, like, defend me a little bit? Like, we're meant to be brothers in a way. So there was that part of it. And then, of course, there was Krim 6's supposedly entirely fabricated story that Formal pushed back on a little bit and said, well, are you sure that happened, Ian? Like, I didn't hear about that. But it was a private story, so what do you expect him to say? And, you know, Scump kind of, look, Krim is in the room. It's how it goes. Scump isn't going to sit there and be like, nah, no way, I'm sorry, my boy Nade, there's no way he said that to you. And that's just not how it's going to work. But Nadejot still feels like, and I totally get it, that Scump could have done a better job defending his honor. Krim wanted me out, right? We all, <laughs> didn't we all? Yeah, I think he all. wanted himself out. Yeah, no. I, I vaguely remember being at the bar and him coming up to us and like apologizing and saying like, 
I'm just gonna stop. Like, yeah, I think we all like after the, after champs, we all like kind we all not kind of we all wanted him out, and then I think he kind of knew that we all wanted him out, and that's he just stepped down. So like he wasn't officially yeah. dropped because he just knew like the vibe that we were getting given off. It was like. Yeah, he I just, don't remember, but like I, mean, yeah, I, I think he just yeah. knew, and then he was like, "The one I'm stepping down. thing that like, are you mad at Scump, dude? Scump's my guy, man. He stood at my wedding. Do I? Do I? Listen, I, I know who Scump is, and I know what type of person he is. You know, he's a laid back, easy going, funny, goofy guy. That's why we love him. Dude, I, I, I mean that with everything I say. Like, I love Scump to death. Do I wish he would have, you know, maybe stood the line a little bit more? You know, stood the Held, held the line for me. Yeah, absolutely. It would have been nice, but like the man's not picking sides. It's not like he's like, oh yeah, Crim Six, you're absolutely right, bro. I can totally tell why you're checked. He's like, just trying to empathize with Crim, who's sitting in front of him telling that story. But yeah, you know, I, dude. At the end of the day, this guy Scump probably teamed with Crim longer than he teamed with me, and I know me and Scump are boys. But yeah, it sure would have been nice to have him say something, man. Like you know. All right. So wait, what? What did people want me to defend him about? I'm gonna. I'll open the floor with that real quick. The tax write-off stuff. Okay. I'm just gonna say one thing about that. How the fuck do you expect me to defend Matt over something that came from Crim Six Head? How do you expect? What? How do you expect me to defend him on that? That literally came from Ian's head. What am I, in Ian's mind? What are we talking about, dude? I was listening to what Ian had to say. I, I listened, and that was it. That was it. What the f am I supposed to defend him about, dude? I don't, I don't really understand what the disconnect is. Exactly, dude. I mean, like, people are, people are mad at me for def not defending him, but, like, dude, it's coming from Ian's mind. I just don't understand how the f I would even defend him when it's coming from Ian's mind. I sat there, I listened. Me and didn't me and Formal say I don't remember that? Didn't we say that? Did we not say that? Just formal. Okay, well, I thought that I said it too, but whatever. I mean, I don't remember that at all. I don't remember it. It came from Ian's mind. He wished you backed him up more. Alright, well then that's my bad. How am I supposed to back up something that I don't remember? I uh, I don't know. Like y'all are asking me to take a side, and I don't even know what I don't know what to do. You know, it, that comment was to Ian to Matt or Matt to Ian, whatever it was. So while the blunt of the frustration is obviously towards Krim on this one. I kind of get what Nade is saying that Scump maybe could have handled this a little bit differently, but then as Scump said on stream and. Look, Scump usually does a very good job keeping himself out of drama, but the issue is sometimes that by keeping yourself out of drama, you actually create the drama, because on this occasion, by Scump deciding in the moment on the podcast to kind of, you know, not give any, co not like, you know, pipe up at Krim, because Scump could have come back at Krim and said, oh, like, that was a BS excuse and like, what do you mean Nade Shot checked you out by, like, donating the money to tax, to tax right off charity or whatever, like, that was, if that was his plan, even if that's true, like, if Scump had come back at Krim and said that, then obviously that would have caused a little bit of friction in person, but, you know, Scump kind of finds himself between a rock and a hard place here, because by not saying that, and by kind of understanding what Krim6 is saying, and not pushing back on it at all in the moment, then, you know, he creates the drama with Nate Shot in some sense. It's like, it's a lose-lose for Scump, really, because, you know, Scump always tries to keep himself out of any controversy like this, but sometimes things happen that you simply can't avoid it. And Scump was obviously frustrated on stream about, um, you know, the way that people perceived his handling of it. He's like, look, this came from Crimson's head, apparently, at least, according to Nate Shot. And, um, you know, what am I meant to do about that? How could I disagree with a story that is entirely fabricated? And you can argue, as I say, that the 
way that Crim6 said it was almost, it sounded like Crim6 was putting the blame of the tournament on Najot for saying that he was going to donate the money to charity and therefore his head wasn't fully in it and therefore Crim played badly. So, you know, Crim6's statement was uh, pretty outrageous. And there's an argument to say that he could have pushed back on that anyway. But often you're doing this podcast with all your old mates on this episode. You know, it's not really going to happen, is it? So I think that Scump just finds himself in the unfortunate position of being caught in the crossfire, really, of this drama. And this is how things go, unfortunately, from time to time. So, yeah, look, I did not think that we'd be here in 2023, nearly 2024, and we'd be having, you know, drama with regard to the Optic Dynasty that collapsed back in 2015, you know? Like, it's just how things tend to go in this cod space that a team that broke up eight years ago still things are coming to the surface today. So like, you can't stop it. It's how it goes. And I can understand that the frustrations from all sides on this one. Formal being formal, he don't care. You know what I mean? Well, maybe he does care, but he's not like he's tweeted about it. And, um, you know, he's just started to tweet more Halo highlights. Some pretty disgusting ones, actually, at that as well. But Formal didn't seem to have too much of a thought on this. I mean, like, he said what he said at the time. I don't think anything he said was entirely ridiculous either. It's just how it goes. I do wonder in several years time whether there'll be similar drama with other like current, let's say, trios or dominant teams. I mean, the phase guys, Selium, Simpid, Abizi, you know, at, at some point they've got to split up, you would think. I mean, it's not happened yet. It's probably not going to happen for the next couple of years, but at some point it might happen. And if, as and when it does, there might be something on that. I don't know. I don't think it's ever going to be to the extent of what we've just seen over the last couple of days here. And, you know, the interest in the phase trio podcast in eight years is not going to have the same impact that the Dynasty podcast has just had. You would well imagine, unless COD massively blows up in the next few years. But, um, you know, this is some of their records I thought was interesting. There was also this, which is pretty crazy. Simba Beezy's record against other players. Now, we'll get back to this one, actually, in a second. This is their list of, well, their record against pros, listed by number of total games. You know, some of these guys are getting cooked hard. And um, a lot of it, to be fair, is the European players. It's actually kind of tragic, to be fair. The players that have the best records are almost exclusively the Optic players. But um, yeah, some of the BZ's record against these guys is kind of absurd. Bounce their 22 and 3 against. Clinics 19 and 6. 11 and 4 or 14 to 11 for Envoy. Negative record against Shotzi. And um, not many positive records here at all. Actually, Dashi is 9 to 12. So against Dashi is pretty much their worst record. And TJ, poor TJ, man, they are 17 in 1 against him. So that's not pretty either. They're even 14 in 5 against Clay, despite the fact that he taught them everything they knew. Well, obviously not true. You know what I mean? They um, started playing on this level when they were teaming with Clay and they went on to demolish him over the next couple of years. And there are a few players that which they're undefeated against. So if you thought 17 to 1 was bad, then, well, here's a few other options. So against Temp, they're 13 and 0. Scraps, they're 11 and 0. And um, even the likes of Dylan Cod over Black Ops 4 and I guess the start of the Royal Raven season in MW19... As I say, unfortunately, a lot of UK and European players on air, but it is what it is. Even Zuma, they were 5-0 against him, and, um, well, plenty of players here down to 2-0, which they're, I mean, there's so many players they're just undefeated against, which is kind of absurd, to be honest. There's only six players they have a losing record against. Shotzi, Dashi, Priestat, Classic, which is kind of funny, right? Spart as well, and also Ghosty. Ghosty has never lost to FaZe, and uh, never lost to Simpid Abizi, which is crazy. I don't expect that to last too much longer, right? I mean, he joined Optic, they won all the series they played against FaZe that last season. But you would expect probably this record starts going the other way going forwards. But then again, we talked about that with Pred and TJ Halley, that Pred has never beaten TJ Halley, no matter what team TJ's been on. And that's something that you wouldn't think would be the case, but it is. And you would expect that story to change if TJ gets a spot in the league again, as you would expect this story to change. Maybe there's just some sort of like boogeyman type thing going on there and a Zed says, you know, they just got lucky against me seven times in a row. But very much intrigued to your thoughts and all this stuff in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care and I'll see you next time.